And I'm going to um, introduce our session and then turn it over. Um, so we have a very cool uh, session today, Letters from Skua. Um, this is our first dramatic reading that is part of the ULVLC, and I, for one, am quite excited. Um, I am just going to remind y'all, again, I'm looking at the participant list, and I'm seeing lots of folks who've been to these before. Um, so we uh, will be using the chat. Um, so if you have questions or if you have comments or anything that comes up, please feel free to put those in the chat. I'll keep an eye on them while our dramatic readers are in character um, so that they don't have to uh, be worrying too much about that. Um, and I think that's it. So I'm going to turn off my audio and video and turn it over to our friends from SCUA. Take All right. Hello and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. One of the most fascinating aspects of working with manuscripts collections is reading through the day-to-day -day correspondence of the person. In this day of emails, text messaging, and social media, we don't realize how much our communication has changed and how special it was to hear from someone from a distance. Receiving and writing a letter was an effort and an event, whether the letter was written to a loved one or someone you were angry with. In SCUA, we read a lot of letters in the course of processing collections, and Beth Ann, Kathleen, and I have selected a few from across our collections. Before each letter, we will give a bit of an introduction and context. I hope you enjoy these letters, and if you have any time at the end, um, we would be happy to take questions about the content of the letters or anything else archives related. Helen, Helen Bowling Potts on the left there was born in 1919 in High Point, North Carolina. She attended women's college and graduated with a degree in physical education in 1939. She taught for two years in Rocky Mount and then worked on a Works Progress Administration, WPA, project in Fayetteville. In December of 1942, she joined the American Red Cross. Um, she was assigned to the 23rd Street YMCA in New York City where she accompanied French sailors on tours of the city. In 1943, she was sent overseas to work as a donut girl in England, France, and Germany. Balling wrote this letter to her former professor, Mary Channing Coleman, Channing Coleman, who's there on the right, who is the head of the Women's College Department of Physical Education. This letter is from September 18th, 1944. Dear Ms. Coleman, I had received the first alumni bulletin in two years a few days ago before I had an opportunity one day to go through a school set up by the Nazi socialist state. And the combination made me think so very much about those days back in 1939 when we used to sit on the second floor and discuss all the problems of education and physical education that we thought would one day meet in our workaday world. So just as I used to do in student days, I wanted to tell you a story as I've seen it. Perhaps these students working now will see answers those of us here in the middle of it cannot see. I'm still on a club mobile. That's the same glorified term for a donut wagon. And we still make donuts and coffee, only now we hand them out to fighting men, along with the candy, cigarettes, newspapers, <sighs> where you can get them writing paper, music, and a lot of chatter. Our 16 months in England helped a great deal in preparing us, but every day we learn a lot more about what the men in this army want in the way of recreation, so we continually try to dream up new ideas. We first came to France on D plus 40, so we've lived right in the field just as the soldiers do. At first it was foxholes and pup tents, and you wished many times that you were still in the same physical condition as when you left school. We drive our own two and a half GMC trucks and live in battle dress. It's Girl Scout camping on a grandiose scale and no running to town at the end of the week. Showers are a luxury. And one day a countess on whose second cow pasture we bivouacked offered us the usage of her bathtub for an hour and we almost mobbed her. We've even learned to laugh at what one of my crew members calls quote unquote cow excrement. This frequently covers the field in which you are to live and must be shoveled away before you can pitch the tent. Still, as we talk with the men and hash over all the things we see, we all wonder what we're going to do about these conditions as they exist. 
Certainly in the daily rush of the fighting, the men have little time to think about solutions. The few girls around with the Army Nurse Corps and the American Red Cross are just as busy. And after reading the few publications we can put our finger on, we wonder if those planning back home realize just what we do face. We found quite near a bivouac area we visited the other day, one of the schools established by Hitler's state for the quote, child and the mother, end quote. When I saw the equipment, the physical setup, and remembered my own experiences and struggles for just part of that in our own schools, I really began to just wonder how we will ever combat this system, even as it is settled with force. Let me describe the physical setup as I saw it and tell you the little I could learn through my GI interpreter from a woman who had been left behind. The school was housed, true enough, in wooden buildings, unattractive and barren from the outside, but inside, another story. As we entered, we found coat hangers at graduated heights for children from about two to six, with very attractive pictures to designate each. Only on the boys' side, all of the pictures were of planes, guns, tanks, or some such. The next room contained a sand table, an aquarium, tables of varying heights, and walls suitable for pictures. Of course, in the process of its being turned into sleeping quarters, all the pictures have been removed. The next room had only facilities for feeding the children, but what a complete setup. The washing and toilet facilities were installed in suitable sizes in the middle of the building. A very large room covered in the back of the building. At one end were stacked basket weave cots and at the other pile wooden guns, dumbbells, and apparatus equipment. Obviously a large combination game and restroom. The last room was piled with debris of movable equipment, evidences of craft work, storybooks, maps, geography books, and even coveralls mixed in with dabs, of paint, uh, dabs and streaks of paint on them. We rummaged through the books and even in Anderson's fairy tales and fables, the moral of the story was always the glory of the fatherland. The maps were composite pictures of Europe labeled our glorious fatherland. From the women where, where we found that the children came there, there, from the women where we found that the children came there at the age of two and remained until six. We spent the entire day there and were boarded out at night with families in the town as their own families had been sent deeper in the country to work. I asked about their games and were told that two thirds of the day was spent to achieve physical fitness for the glorification of the country. They were taught according to my GI interpreter, she means games like cowboy and Indian, only with women, wooden guns. The girls do this, use the dumbbells. And remember, these children were only ages two to six. I hope that I'll see a great, I'll see a great many more of their schools as I think there's a great deal to observe from them. But enough on that side. The girls will all probably be glad to know that Paris still is, and in a big way. When we were there, we felt quite dowdy in battle dress, leggings, and helmets among the smartly dressed mademoiselles. Even so, we were practically mobbed as we were among the first American girls they had seen, and they were much more curious about us than we were about them. Never in all my life have I felt so much like the goldfish in the bowl as we did all day that first day. We were surrounded all day, and the display of emotion was even more than we expected from a Frenchman. They have certainly done well with their wartime economies in the way of dress and smart clothes and still in great evidence along with perfume even of Chanel Sanc and Chalamar varieties. My best to all the girls left that I knew and I'm hoping it won't be too long before I can be home and say hello in person. My very best to you and my deepest appreciation for so many of the ideas you passed along to us. I wish I could enumerate how many times they popped out in so many forms. Most sincerely, Helen Balling. Oh dear, I'm up. <clears throat> okay. Um, sometimes we just have the good luck of having a cache of history land on our doorstep. And that's what happened several months ago when we received three letters from Maine written by a distant relative of Welda Worth Williams, class of 1927 at the North Carolina College for Women, now UNCG. Uh, this class of 275 girls would be the largest that the school would graduate up to that point. 
These letters were written in 1923, the fall of Welda's freshman year. And it was really an important time in history and on campus. Um, this was several years after the end of World War I and only three years after the 19th Amendment had been passed, giving women the right to vote. And these letters are as enthusiastic as you would expect them to be from a first year student from Columbus, Georgia. They speak of the beautiful campus, her friends, her dormitory, and the big town of Greensboro that actually has a skyscraper. So this is Welda's world on screen right now um, in the mid 1920s. The campus was in the middle of a building campaign um, funded by post-war money from the North Carolina State Legislature. So you'll see the Faust building that's still there. At the time, um, it was called the Administrative Building, and that's where the junior shop is that Welda spends a lot of time in. Um, the McKeever Memorial Building, now where the nurses building is going up, that was a large classroom at the time, and that's where Welda would have taken most of her classes. The North Carolina um, College for Women Auditorium, which interestingly it's now being called again, is um, on the corner. It is finished building in 1927. The Brown Music Building, Spencer Dormitory you can see in the dining halls right behind it, and finally the quad, which you can see way on the, the other um, end. And um, at the time that she moved in in 1923, it was new. Her, she lived in Henshaw, and it was, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty new at the time. Okay, next slide. Here we go. And there's Welda. We just think she's as cute as she can be. Uh, the dining room, you see the quad as it's being built. Um, and there's the big skyscraper she was talking about, Jefferson, Jefferson Pilot down, downtown. And if, I've got my scrapbook right there. But there is, um, there's the post office, which at the time was in the Faust building. So I am going to read a letter from um, Wilda to her mom and dad. Uh, this is September 17th, 1923. We meet her sister, Catherine, sometimes called Kath or Kay. And she's running into the same problems as many other freshman girls. Let's hear about it. Dear mom and dad, I am so busy that I haven't had time to write a line. I'm perfectly charmed with everything. I've been too busy to get homesick. I've just come back from my medical examination. They pulled me, they thumped me, they made me jump, just everything. Dr. Lanky is our doctor. She's just too lovely. I was so mad last Wednesday. Miss Taylor, our social director, invited all the Henshaw girls to tea. Punch was served. I couldn't go for I had signed up for physical exams at that hour. It took one hour and 45 minutes. I'm 45 pounds overweight, but Dr. Lanky says my frame is large. I should be 130 to 135 pounds, and I weigh 156 now, but I'm gonna reduce. I'm gonna take up basketball and tennis and quit eating the fat foods. Dr. Lanky says that there will be a fat table in the dining room. So, um, if so, I'll go to that one and eat lettuce and vinegar and steaks and the like, and I'll be thin as a bean pole when I arrive at Christmas. Everyone is so friendly here. I just have oodles of friends, but of course I don't remember their names, only faces, no one does. Our tables in the dining hall have not been assembled yet. They draw so many names for the table. I received your delicious candy this morning. It was wonderful. Many of the other girls thought the same. I'll thank Kath for everything in her letter. Maybe I'll have time to write um, this month. The tennis racket is just beautiful. I received it this morning also, but the balls are not here. Give grandma a hug and kiss for me. It was so sweet of her to give it to me. Miss Strong is my math teacher. I'm crazy about her. I worked a volunteer pro pro problem this morning and got it right. And she said, that was very well done. She marked me too, though I don't know what I got. Every little bit counts. When I got to English class this morning, Miss Underhill made us write another essay in class on our English course in high school. I know mine was a mess, but I did my best. The party last Saturday night was dandy. There were exercises given in the chapel by all the different organizations, the YW, all societies, all classes. Some were really a scream. We were thoroughly entertained. It was called the Thousand Second Arabian Night and Estelle couldn't come after me, so she sent a sophomore. She was in two of the sketches. She's good at dramatics. Afterwards, I met Miss Mendenhall and Estelle's brothers. They are a fine family. Then I went down into the gym and danced. I've been there for three nights. It's lots of fun. I'm considered a pretty good dancer, although Catherine doesn't seem to think so. I can't go very often because I've got to work. 
I forgot to tell you how cold it was here. Saturday, I was cold with my sleeveless sweater and my brown sweater too. It was raining and the cold was terribly penetrating. I nearly froze. I'm sure I'll have to, I'll have to get my um, coat pretty soon. I've been wearing my sweater today and yesterday and I wore my cape to church. By the way, may I get a $4 Waterman fountain pen? One which may be worn around the neck? Mine, the pump one I have now, is seven years old and practically worn out. It doesn't hold enough ink and the pen is scratchy. I would love to have a new one. I was very much delighted over the shower of cards. I had wandered down to the post office having no idea that I had any mail and to think there were 13 postcards and one letter. I was so glad to get them that I went down into the gym and danced. Thank, thank all for me as I don't see how I can write right away. I just love a box full of mail. I have just come from supper. We had light bread, creamed Irish potatoes, smothered veal, gravy, butter, and applesauce with whipped cream and cake. It was delicious. It seems that I've done nothing but walk since I've been here. I'm five blocks or more for the past curve from my recitation buildings, McKeever and administration. In the basement of the ladder, the post office is built and there's a post office box for the 1,401 girls registered here. They had to turn away hundreds for new dormitories are going up this year. I just wish you could see the campus, especially spring garden. The lawns are immaculate. Flowers and shrubbery grow in bunches. The trees are beautiful too, especially the silvery maple. I just love it all. It seems to me that I've been here six months or more. I'll go to chapel exercises tomorrow morning. This morning, the first half of the alphabet went, tomorrow I'll go. I wrote to Irene that we could go into town anytime we get, got ready, but I was mistaken. We must ask the social director the first six weeks and register. Then we can go only twice a week at that. You ought to see the boys up here. Lots of girls have dates on Sunday afternoon and nights on Saturday too. I've been only uptown once since I've been here. So you see, I hardly know what Greensboro looks like, only that it is larger than Columbus. There's a tall skyscraper here. I received your package of hangers and I was very glad to get them, but I'll have to get more for I'll have to hang up just about everything. I'm looking forward with great expectation that candy Catherine promised me. I've been eating all those pecans you gave me and surely enjoyed them. I have one left. We have wonderful meals here. This morning we had coffee and grits and potatoes and cream and fish roe and hot biscuits and butter and apples. And last night for supper, we had fresh bread and butter and potato salad with iceberg lettuce and cold sliced ham and salted peanuts and hot chocolate and peaches. Would anything, would anybody want anything better? Yesterday for dinner, we had sweet potatoes, but not as good as Papa's, roast pork, gravy, hot biscuits, ice cream, and cake. The ice cream was great nut, very good. I did miss breakfast yesterday morning. Didn't wake up till 8.15 and breakfast was at eight. Went to Sunday school and church um, at the Covenant with um, Estelle Mendenhall. Enjoyed Sunday school, but I didn't like the sermon, at least the way Dr. Wins preached it. He read it from the pulpit. I'll go to First Presbyterian next Sunday. I have so many millions of things to tell you and I really don't know where to start. Must go to class now. We'll finish this afternoon. Oh, Mother, Leany and I have decided to have our draperies for the windows out of the same kind of creton as the window seat. We want scrim curtains too. Behind the draperies, nothing expensive. By the way, the curtains won't do it all. They're entirely too short and our rods are at the top of the windows. I wish you could have them made at home for I would like to have them as soon as possible for we're on the first floor. Needless to say, we have two windows. Mother dear would surely appreciate them if you would send them soon. Give all my love, affectionately, Welda Williams. So we've, we've got a couple of more welders, but we spaced them out because there's only so much welder you can take together. Oh, I disagree with that, but. <laughs> and now for something completely different. In October of 1979, the Gay Student Union here at UNCG held its first meeting as an official student organization. The Carolinian had an article published on its first page about the formation of the organization, though it managed to incorrectly name it. Regardless of the editing error, the article received a certain amount of, shall we say, heated attention from alumna from the 1920s, verbalizing their shock and anger about the university officially recognizing the rights of an LGBTQ student organization to exist. The following two letters 
are from the Pride Papers and University Archives, the first read by Beth Ann and the second by me. They demonstrate the anti-LGBTQ sentiment negotiated by our university's administration. As a warning, these letters are inflammatory, but the tone of the letters is also so melodramatic as to border on humor. <clears throat> a letter to Ms. Trudy Walton Atkins, the editor of the Alumni News at UNCG. Dear Ms. Atkins, can you assure me that the next possible issue of the Alumni News will carry a story on the authorization by university officials of a gay student union? In the spring issue, I hope. Oh yes, homosexuality is chic now in many parts of our land. It has always become fashionable and every nation turned decadent, thus preferring gay irresponsible sterility to the sober source of its strength, the family and the home. As a writer for the medical news group, now and for nearly 13 years, I've been obliged to learn more about homosexuality than I really care to know. In recent years, the word gay was adopted as a camouflage and has fooled many naive individuals as to gay perversions. But the laws of most states in our country still define homosexuality as a crime against nature, punishable as a felony. UNCG alumni 40 years old and older are the least likely of the various age groups among alumni to have been brainwashed by homosexual propaganda and are most likely to oppose the homosexual organization at our alma mater. Many younger ones, however, are likely to oppose it the regular churchgoers at least. If you do run the story of the founding of this organization, it would be helpful if you would invite readers to comment for the following issue. Yours sincerely, Mrs. Catherine G. Rogers, NCCW alumna, 1926. November 12th, 1979. Dear President Friday, the enclosed paper calling attention to the official encouragement being given to sexual perversion at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro was sent to me by my friend, Mrs. Catherine Rogers of Washington, DC. Both Mrs. Rogers and I are alumnas of the North Carolina College for Women, predecessor of UNCG. I write to protest the use of facilities of a tax supported university by such an organization as that reported in the Carolinian excerpt I also protest the official status given to the organization by the administration, the participation of a faculty member as faculty advisor, and any other activity by which the administration or faculty may be encouraging homosexual activity among university students or others at the university. I call on you to use your official powers to end all use of facilities and personnel for promoting or facilitating homosexual activity at UNCG and of any other institution in the university system where such use is made. Using state funds to promote such perversion is in fact state suicide. Mankind learned many centuries ago that permitting that homosexual activity and comparable perversions are destructive to the societies permitting them. The two-bit theories of today's pseudoscientists are no proper ground for abandoning policies based on the wisdom gained through the ages of human experience experience in which the very theories now advocated fester and have been repeatedly tested and found detrimental to human society. It is the height of arrogance for tax paid officials and faculties at universities to take it upon themselves so drastic and perilous a social change through their power over the young people entrusted to their charge. I urge you to put an end to such efforts in the UNC system. Sincerely yours, Maddie Irma E. Parker, also known as Mrs. John M. Parker III, NCCW, class of 1925. And she was a Dikeyan, yes. <laughs> in, case, in the case of each of the letters that was written, um, the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, James H. Allen, responded, citing court cases in which federal courts overruled universities trying to prohibit gay student organizations. 
Although several alumna protested, the organization continued to endure, and of course we are known as a very LGBT-friendly campus today. And now for a bit of a palate cleanser. In the cello music collection, it is common to find fan mail, as many of our cellists, in addition to being world collections, were also major recording artists. <clears throat> is from a nine-year-old cellist named Jonah Kim to Janus Starker. He was a trendsetter as a classical recording artist with over 150 recordings. In 1997, he was awarded a Grammy for his recordings of the Bach suites for solo cello. He actually recorded those suites twice on two different labels, the first one on the EMI label and the newer one for which he earned the Grammy on RCA. To give you some context, Johann Sebastian Bach's Six Suites for Solo Cello are the compositions by which cellists are popularly judged for their performance ability. Cellists spend a lifetime interpreting those pieces. Here is Jonah's letter. Dearest Mr. Starker, I am a nine-year-old cellist. I started learning cello from two years old and six months before. My father taught me. On May 19th, 1997, I passed the audition at the Juilliard School <clears throat> with a full scholarship by playing the Bach with Six Suites. My father makes me hear the same piece played by different cellists. I like it best hearing the Bach Suite CD you recorded with the RCA company. My father said it is better than the CD you recorded long ago. I practiced with the CD you recorded. When I play to the box suite, strange things happened very often. Every time it happened, I cried. I was surprised, but last time was more than crying. When I was playing box suite three prelude, I disappeared and you were playing it. This is not nonsense. This is true. I was so much surprised. I ran to my father and told him. He said music is not only sound, but also spirit. He said different interpretation causes different emotion. I had the experience of very deep emotion, especially on your RCA record. On the 1958 EMI record, Suite 5, the Allemande was four minutes and 44 seconds, but on the RCA, it was seven minutes, 26 seconds more longer, just like a dream. My father said, Mr. Starker has pulled out box music from the doctrine of the church to the freedom of the world. My father said, you are very old. I hope you will live happily and healthy until, you, till, until I meet you. We plan to study at Juilliard until I am 12 years old, but I pray to seek you soon. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, Jonah Kim, December 12, 1997. And in case you were wondering, Jonah did meet Janusz Starker and study with him. And according to Starker, Jonah was an, is an exceptional talent. He is the top of his generation. Jonah presently is pursuing a successful career as a concert cellist. And he was referred to by a critic with the Washington Post as the next Yo-Yo Ma, and has already been the recipient of two Grammy Awards. Oh dear, we're back with Welda. Okay. In the next letter, we see, we see Welda having more adventures on campus. And she mentions some places that, that, you know, in the archives we definitely know, like the old YWCA hut, which you see on the right, which was built during World War I. Um, there's the exterior and the interior. She talks about a streetcar that was specially designed to take the students to church. Um, and she, but most interestingly, she talks about this freshman and junior wedding celebration. This is really hard to find information on in the archive. It was kind of student orientated and so it really doesn't show up in much research. But I actually found um, a picture of it from one of the articles in the campus newspaper and it's up here. And it literally is just like a wedding. They're, the girls dress like groomsmen and bridesmaids and um, kind of it's a symbolic wedding between the freshmen and the juniors. She also talks about her friend. She'll talk about Tempe, 
who is one of her best friends, and we've got the, she's the short one right in the middle of this picture, and a visit by Irene Castle, who was a member of a dance team, Irene and Vernon Castle. Uh, Vernon Castle came, uh, I mean, died in 1918, so Irene came alone. And you'll start to notice that um, Welda is, is apparently needing some money because she starts to hit up mom. Okay, September 29th, my darling mother, this is Saturday night and I'm sitting on my bed thinking of home, how I would like to see one and all of you, but I'm having such a good time. I'll tell you what I've done today. First of all, I went hiking this morning, five miles without stopping one second. The sun was not quite up yet when I arose and it was lovely outside. I think I did a pretty, pretty well for my first hike. I was one of the four to get to the spring first. I nearly died at first, but I finally caught my breath and then it wasn't so bad. One must hike 50 miles to join the hiking club. Then if one hikes 50 more, one is entitled to go on a camping trip. I think that I'll hike at least 50. The girls have been taking frequent trips to Guilford College, five miles out and back. Probably I'll go sometime next week. I would have hiked before, but as it was just out of the, I was just out of the infirmary and I was afraid to try it. When I came back from my hike, I had 15 minutes before breakfast. After changing into my Oxford for, for white sandals, I made up my bed and went to breakfast. At breakfast, I had hard boiled eggs and hot biscuits, grits, puffed rice, coffee, milk, grapes, butter, etc. I took a cold bath and dressed in my old green voile, white sandals and hose. After having swept and straightened the room, it was nine o'clock, time for French. I got along okay in that. By the way, Miss Laird is taking orders for silver bracelets made by French soldiers wounded in battle. These bracelets are made of shells, of bullets, dipped in silver, shaped like a cross, like this, and then she draws a few. I think that they are real cute for 50 cents. Then too, there are lovely paper cutters in the shape of swords, 50 cents. They are beautiful. Do you think that it would be advisable to get three or four for Christmas maybe? Please let me know. I thought you might want some paper cutters for friends too. If the, go, if the order goes off now, I'll get them in November. So after French, I went to the library to study for my chemistry quiz. And then I went to the post office and got that delicious candy. Lini says it's the best she's ever eaten. One girl insists on having the recipe, so I guess Catherine will have to send it. Thank her for me. Tell her I enjoyed her letter. I read Mrs. G, Mistress G's 18 page one too. It was very good to hear all the news. The chemistry quiz was not hard at all. After chemistry, it was time for lunch. We had brown eyed peas, potatoes a la gratin, bread, butter, tongue sliced, ginger cakes, and purple plums. All of it was delicious. After lunch, I visited a little and had visitors. At 2.30, I began to get ready for the junior freshman reception. We were issued this enclosed invitation this morning. Please save it because I want to put it in my memory book. I wore my, right, my white Canton crepe with a silver band around my head. Everybody wears a ribbon band around their head. It's very stylish. By the way, Irene Castle is coming here to dance next Friday. I'm dying to see her. I think the tickets will be from 150 to 250. Please may I go? I have some money of my own, about that much. So please let me know right away for you see it is September 5th. Returning to the subject, the reception and dance. I had a gorgeous time. A mock marriage was staged in the auditorium and it was most excellent. Girls dressed as ushers and ushered us in. The stage was decorated like a church, candles and everything. A junior came out and sang, I love you. Then came the wedding march. Oh, the flower girls were a scream and the weeping mothers. The best man, groom, preachers looked just like men. Absolutely, we nearly died laughing. The bride was adorable and were the, as were the bridesmaids. It was so much like a real wedding, of course. The ceremony was worded ridiculously. After the departure of the bridal party, we went down to the Adelphian and Deacon Society Hall. There we shook hands with every one of the bridal party, had refreshments like strawberry and vanilla ice cream, and later we danced. I sure had oodles of fun. Dear Mother, this is Sunday morning, a beautiful day, and I'm going to First Presbyterian Church with Leany, Sarah Layton, and MG. I shall wear my new brown Canton crepe. The weather is exactly right for it. I had a pretty good breakfast this morning, and I got there in time. We had muffin and grits and bacon and post toasties and cream and prunes, etc. Everything was delicious. Returning again to the subject, I went to the YW hut yesterday. It's a lot bigger than the picture and cute. Those postcards make me positively sick. The buildings, the scenes are nothing like the real thing. Um, I was having such a good time at the hut. 
when I discovered it was six o'clock, dinner time. Well, Levi and I lit out, but I didn't get there in time and was locked out. I was so tired from running that I went to bed. I had a date with another girl to dance on the terrace at Cotton Hall, but had to break it. Well, Lini brought me an apple and I ate some divinity, but I was too tired to go to the store. We may go at 7.30. So you see, I wasn't bad off as I had the ice cream at the reception. Next, I read one hour of Guy de Maupassant's short stories. Then I cut up with some of the girls. Then I read some of their love letters. It's lots of fun. I guess that's all I did yesterday. I think that was enough. Oh, and hygiene the other day, we were told that every one of us had to have a raincoat and couldn't get out of getting one. Now the Athletic Association put up a book selling, put up a booth selling raincoats at 525, and they're nice too. And as you know, a good one costs 10 or $15 uptown. So I put it in order for one for me. Was that that all right? They're very nice, good quality. But if I should go to town and find a coat, how much will you let me pay for it? How much shall I pay for it? Oh, and as for the curtains, so Lini has not said anything about paying for half. I guess that they will be mine. I think that if she doesn't furnish the curtains, let her furnish the rugs. It won't be fair if I do it all. She wants rugs, let her buy them. I've just waked up from a nap. I certainly enjoyed the sermon. Dr. Myers is splendid. The music was beautiful too. I could have listened all day. The church was packed. There's a special streetcar that takes us college girls to church. Coming back, I had to stand, but such is life. There's a grocery store about a block off campus. They sell all sorts of candy and chicken salad sandwiches and hot dogs. The junior shop sells candy and other things too. It's in the basement of the administration building. I'll send you my schedule with my English class changes. Lovingly, Welda. Dorothy Dottie Avery. Uh, of Salt Lake City, Utah, was a pilot in the WASPs, the Women Air Force Service Pilots, from 1943 to 1944. She was in the seventh class, beginning her training at Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas, in May 1943. After graduating in November of 1943, she was sent to Mather Field, California, for advanced training and was later stationed at March Field in California. After the WASPs were disbanded, she worked at a, as an inspector for the Navy Lockheed Service Center. In this letter, written while she was in training to an unnamed recipient, Dottie gives a timeline of a typical day at Sweetwater. 6.15 a.m. Oh, hum, blast that bugler. Anyway, I could do with six more hours sleep. Like a bunch of mad things, we get dressed, make our beds, etc., while the bay orderlies sweep and mop the floor. We take turns being bay orderlies, two girls every three days. 6.45 a.m., five-minute call for mess formation. 6.50 a.m., mess formation, march to mess hall. 6.55 a.m., we eat and by now are half awake. 7.20 a.m., class formation, run back to bay to get books, Run back to formation. 7.25 a.m., march to class. 7.30 a.m., navigation class. Had a test and got 100%. Boy, am I smart. 8.30 a.m., mathematics. I stink. No test yet, but I know I will flunk. If we get below 70%, no open post. I won't be of this field for six months. 9.30 a.m., back to bay. Study until 10.20 a.m., then drill formation. Alternate days, we have physical training. Excuse me while I study math. 10.20 a.m., drill formation. 11 a.m., back and it is hot out. I will quickly take a shower and study some more. 11.45 a.m., lunch mess call. Lunch wasn't very good. It was all right, just the same old thing. Beef, veg, potatoes, salad, pudding, iced tea. You take what you want. I didn't eat much as I am not used to two heavy meals a day. 1240, flight line formation. Here we go off to fly. I wonder what period I fly today. We have to stay on the flight line five hours. There are five girls to every instructor. That means one hour a piece, unless some other instructor gives you an extra period. 1245, on the field in ready room. 
I fly second period, 1400 o'clock. That's 2 p.m. to you. Have to go out and check the ship and the chute. 15.05. Boy, is it hot up here. I just got down. Did the same as usual. Pretty good. He said my spins were good. I'm glad. I was sort of worried. Gotta study now here in the ready room. 17.30. Back to our base for a nice shower and to get dressed for dinner. We get to put slacks on for dinner. I'm second in, on the shower, so here I go. 18.25. Mess call and we are all very hungry and feel much better after shower and getting dressed. Oh, and I washed my hair in the shower. 1905, back from dinner. We'll now take my little arithmetic book and go to study hall where there is peace and quiet. 2130, my math teacher was at study hall, so I got the lowdown on a lot of stuff. However, it's still very vague. Ratio, algebra, etc. 2159, I must now jump into my little bed as taps will sound off any minute and all lights out. So ends the life of a rookie for one day with the 318th Army Air Force's Flying Training Detachment, Class 43W-7, Flight 1, Barracks J-2, Avenger Field Sweetwater. Good night from rookie Sonny Avery. P.S. We would appreciate it if you could get us some 620 film rolls. Then we could take pictures for you. Sam, I think you had a question about where is Dottie stationed right now? Is that from Patrick? Wasn't it Sweetwater? Oh, she's in um, the basic training. So basically, um, you know, they, they train them. They already had to have a license to fly, but they got sent to Sweetwater to learn the Army way of flying. And, um, you know, there was a high chance of washing out. So it was uh, quite stressful. But she did her spins very well. Any, any other questions for Dottie? So the last letter from Weldon, I promise it's short. She writes on Thanksgiving Day, 1923, and she talks mostly about her friends, Thelma, Edith, Tempe, and the Carolines. And she starts off with, Dear Mother, you are just the sweetest thing to send me that lovely box. My, and what a delicious box. It arrived yesterday afternoon at five. And this morning, guess what? I got a box of homemade oatmeal candy and peanuts from Mrs. Gilbert. I got so many nice things that I almost felt like crying. And I know I don't deserve them. They have given me so much pleasure. I'll tell you about it. Yesterday morning, I woke up feeling perfectly miserable, splitting headache and everything. I started to go to the infirmary, but decided to go to classes because I had a math test. Well, somehow I got there and Miss Rowley was so sweet, she didn't assign us a lesson for tomorrow. I had an hour between English and math, so don't seem surprised, but I went to the library and went to sleep. I woke up in plenty of time and I think I got through the math test fairly well, but my head was hurting so bad that I could hardly see. I went to lunch, but I didn't eat anything. Then I came home and I told Lini goodbye and went to bed, and that was about 1.45, and I didn't wake up till five when the maid brought in my lovely box. I felt so much better. I didn't even have a headache. I got some girls to come in while I opened it. I was never so surprised in all my life. Everything is perfectly splendid, especially that lovely fruitcake. I'm so glad I got a nice box for lots of others got them too. Thelma Ross, a girl across the hall, got fried chicken salad, angel cake, and etc. She and I spread, spread ours together in my room this morning and invited in lots of girls. I've never seen such a lovely spread. I couldn't get it all on the table. Everybody so praised Catherine's cooking and said to tell you they enjoyed it as much as I did. You don't know how much I thank you for it. I simply can't express it. Two are about that days after you told me about Mrs. Gilbert. She sent me a dear little note and I was gonna answer it today when I received a Whitman sampler box just full of delicious candy and salted peanuts. I'm certainly gonna write her now. I was so filled up this morning that when I went to dinner, I ate only a roll and one slice of turkey. Yes, we had baked turkey. It was delicious, but it was physically impossible to eat more. I could not touch the pumpkin pie. None of the girls were hungry. It seemed that all the girls were having company this afternoon. Wish I could have a peep at you all. I have plenty to do. Must read that pesky French play and write an essay on it. 
You must work on math too. And there are letters to write and stockings to darn. By the way, mother, I'll have to send home two or three of my dresses to be laundered because they have not been washed before. I mean, my brown gingham and brown trim and the white linen. If they are once laundered, I can send them to be washed here. Do you know they will do blankets too? For nothing? They clean your rugs also. Last night, I wasn't a bit lonesome. The other Caroline Price spent the night with me. Isn't it funny? There's a Caroline Price, a freshman who's living in, in 110 Bailey, while my roommate, Carolina Price, lives in 110 Henshaw. They have the same P.O. box too. Tempe Lee Williams is my box mate. She's just as cute as she can be. She's about the smallest girl on the campus. Well, Caroline and I talked till 1130 after the light bell. We had a fine time. And before bedtime, Jesse Wicker and Edith Moore came in and I fed them up and showed them my memory book and annual. Tell Kay they said that she sure was pretty. I have one of her pictures here and everybody said she sure is pretty. Tell brother I'm gonna write him too this week. Give all my love to everybody, but keep a big kiss and hug for yourself. Affectionately, Welda. And that's all we know of Welda. We do not have any more letters and uh, we do not have any letters from her parents. And we don't have any information after she graduated, right? Well, we know that she actually got married and moved to Gastonia. I think she married a Mr. Shuford and moved to Gastonia and lived happily ever after. <laughs> Hope she got some good treats. <laughs> All right. So does anyone have any questions about some of the letters we have read to you or if... Um, any questions about Scuola in general? Oh dear. Yeah. AC, I don't think we should open that up. <laughs> That's dangerous. Nathan, you have a question for yourself? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll save that. I'll ask. Good, good question, Sean. Um, Patrick asks, were there responses to the anti-gay letters? And yes, all of the responses were written by um, James H. Allen, Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs. Um, so he responded basically saying that um, the organization meets the requirements of any student organization on campus and he cites federal court cases to indicate there's pretty much no way the campus is going to try to prohibit the organization because there were so many other cam campuses trying to, uh, sue trying to prohibit LGBT organizations and getting sued. So um, that was the, the typical response. And for the record, um, funding for student organizations does not come from taxpayers, it comes from student fees. Would anyone be interested if we did another round of letters? But I, I will say we don't have any more well though. That would be fun, okay. There were other letters we wanted to include. Um, we had to time this pretty, you know, some of these letters, like Waldo's, took a little bit longer, but we enjoyed them so much. And we cut some of them. We cut out a lot of those first two letters. She, she did go on yeah. and on. So we, we do have a few letters we had wanted to include that we can um, include in the next version. Uh, I would absolutely love you, Patrick, to read a juicy one from Jan Van Dyke's next time. Is that, is, is that a cellist? No, that's dance. Okay. Oh, Patrick. Dance. <laughs> that it. We have it in writing. Dance. <laughs> <laughs> be a lot of food. How much food can you capture, I guess? All right. Well, thanks. Everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and thanks to our presenters for putting together such a lovely presentation. I definitely would like to see a part two. Um, so y'all get in touch with me. Let me know. I hope, I hope everyone has tongue for lunch. Ugh. Ugh. All right. All right, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.